And so uh, it's 2.20 uh, p.m. and it's time uh, to talk uh, with Shane about supercharging microservice with Service Mesh. Uh, and uh, Shane, you are a team, le team lead at Solo.io. Are you able to join, Shane? Yeah, can you guys yeah. hear me? Yes, we can hear you, are you. And oh, yeah, we can see the mascot. Hey, we can see the <laughs> Got a little solo. glue guy here. He's our solo mascot. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on supercharging your microservices yeah. with Service Mesh. Can you go full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Can we, you guys see, see that? Yeah. Can you go full screen? We still see your, uh, you know, like desktop. Um, let's see. I'm in, I'm in like the side menu presenting mode, so it's, I don't know if it's letting me. We might just have to run with it like this. Yeah, maybe it's okay. If if you can run like this, but if you if if there is a full screen, that's great. If not, we will just see some uh, some 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 menu. <laughs> All right, let's let's just run it like this for now, and yeah. we'll, we'll perfect. See okay. Enjoy your time with us, Shane. See you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. All right. So uh, yes, like I said, uh, I'm Shane O'Donnell. I'm a team lead here at Solo.io, and you know we're going to be covering a lot of stuff here in the next twenty minutes. So. We'll have questions at the end, but if we don't have time to get to your question or if you think of anything later, you can reach out to me directly on Twitter or you can come join us on our Slack and ask us any questions you have about uh, Service Mesh. So today we're going to be talking about you know, microservices, why they're great, and some of the challenges that they kind of introduce because for all the benefits they have, they're obviously going to introduce some inevitable complexity to your system. And there's, there's different ways to solve that. And we're going to kind of walk you through the Service Mesh journey and then introduce Envoy and Istio, talk a little bit about why they're perfectly suited to solve those problems, introduce the concepts of control planes and data planes, and then move into more advanced use cases as we start moving towards multi-cluster and multi-mesh adoption. Uh, if there's time at the end, we're going to do a quick demo of uh, global service failover as well, which is a feature that uh, a lot of people uh, really love as they get to multi-cluster big mesh scale. So let's just kind of set up our example environment here. You can imagine you've got a simple microservices setup where we start off with a product service and a review service. So this could be any kind of product and say the reviews is just like some kind of text reviews. Um, then you get a feature request from your product manager that says, we want to add like a five ratings stars out of five. So in microservices land, this usually means you're going to introduce some kind of a rating service. But obviously it's not as simple as just drawing three boxes on a whiteboard. You know, this involves some actual architecture rollout plans and you're going to have to make sure everything can talk to everything. And in some cases, more importantly, make sure some things can't talk to other things. So what might a rollout like this look like? So what we're going to do is we are going to probably roll out a V2 of our review service and then roll out the first version of a rating service. And then we might have some kind of a period where for a time we're going to do a canary release where maybe 5% or 50% of our traffic goes to our second version and then starts, uh, you know, if it's hitting the version two of the review service, it's going to then have requests sent to ratings, but if it's hitting version one, there's no ratings yet. So it'll just kind of terminate there and return to the user. And then as you get more and more features, or maybe you're fixing bugs or you need to make breaking changes in your API, you start adding more services. And before long, you're gonna have a review service V2, a rating service V2. You can also imagine product service V2. And you know, even though this is a very simple demonstration example, you can see this gets out of hand really quickly. It's gonna be really hard to, to manage. Uh, on top of all this, you know, you probably want high availability. So now you have at least two of all of these, probably more. And suddenly our simple example with three services has two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 different services that all need to be run, all need to be like health checked. They all need to be able to communicate with some services and then explicitly not communicate with other services. So, you know, there's a lot to unravel. There's a lot of different problems to solve. Um, and we're going to just take a quick look at some of the tools that really help us kind of solve these problems. So the first one is Envoy. And Envoy is an open source level seven proxy or layer seven proxy that's uh, built kind of with the cloud in mind. It's primarily built just, you know, to be cloud native. It is a CNCF graduated project. Uh, and, you know, it, it's it's got all these really powerful features that are really suited to, to the cloud, like security, observability, uh, service discovery, and it's incredibly high performance, incredibly low footprint. Uh, but for me, I think the real killer feature is this dynamic configuration. So how Envoy handles its configuration is it exposes and um, almost all of its configuration over a, a runtime API that they call the XDS API. And what this allows you to do is provide configuration updates at runtime in real time and be able to kind of update all, all kinds of configurations. So new authentication policies, new authorization policies, maybe rate limits, maybe add services, remove services, do canary deployments. And you know, 
with a traditional like proxy that you might have deployed in front of your monolith, maybe there's some kind of an XML configuration and you need to restart your proxy server, maybe even have some downtime or do like a whole rolling deployment. But when you get to microservices, obviously you might have dozens of services and doing you know dozens of production releases a day and you can't just deal with that downtime you can't have like release managers that have to handle that you want to be able to iterate quickly and make this go as smooth as possible so by putting all that configuration on an api it's it's incredibly easy to automate a lot of this, this problem so this is kind of where istio steps in so we have our three services from earlier our product reviews and rating service and what istio is going to do is inject what we call a sidecar. So this is an Envoy proxy that's going to run alongside each of the services in Kubernetes. So you've got these two containers running in a single pod. And this sidecar kind of acts as like a bouncer for all of the services and, and also like a navigator and a, and a timekeeper. So all of the requests that go to and from each of these services are handled by Envoy. And the, the great thing about this is that all of the Envoys know about all of the other Envoys. And that's because they're all being fed this new configuration updates constantly over this XDS API. Istio ships this, uh, this service called Istio D, which is the control plane that's going to control all of these Envoy proxies. So there's kind of these two different concepts you need to keep in mind. First one is the data plane. So this is where all of the requests that come into your service, these are your user traffic that's coming into your cluster and going through all your microservices. All of these are going through your Envoy proxies. But then separately, we have this control plane, which is this API server that handles the configuration so that all of your Envoy proxies know about each other, know about which other proxies they're allowed to talk to, get all their configuration, maybe set things like rate limiting up, all that kind of stuff. So it's 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 incredibly powerful, but then because all of the proxies have the addresses of the other proxies, you get that, that's why it's called like a mesh. They're all able to talk to each other directly without having to go some, through some kind of centralized um, setup. Now, obviously, you know, service mesh is a pretty complicated process and to, to set up, especially if you're new to microservices, new to the cloud, new to tools like Kubernetes, there's, there's a lot to learn. So we see folks generally in kind of one of these broad four stages of adoption of service mesh. So the first one is what we call this crawl stage. And this is when you're brand new to service mesh. Maybe you don't really know um, that much about the concepts. You're still getting familiar with it. Maybe you're doing a POC. You're reaching out to firms with more expertise to do tech advisory and kind of getting familiar with it. Once you're familiar with it, you're in kind of what we call the walk phase. Uh, this is probably enough for you to go to your first release of a production, maybe on a small, small setup. You're getting more familiar with the concepts. Maybe you're using an API gateway for your ingress traffic. So you're using the same proxy service to let traffic into your cluster, as well as that east-west gateway traffic. Um, you're getting better on security. So you've probably got a zero trust setup where you have mutual TLS set up. So you have end-to-end -end encryption between uh, various services within your mesh. Uh, you've got observability. So you know one of the great things about having those sidecars sitting next to each of your proxies, like we said back here, is you can offload things that are typically like a network proxies bread and butter. So things like keeping track of metrics, uh, keeping, you know, like what is the latency of all these services? How many services are failing with HTTP 500s? All of those metrics Envoy can handle. And then that way your app developers writing your microservices can really focus on the things that matter, like your business logic. And so, and that's just to talk to the, the observability point specifically. So Istio will help you aggregate all of that stuff into one place, and then you can plug in whatever your favorite uh, observability and metrics tools are. So like Prometheus or Grafana or Kiali are some fantastic examples that are that are there from the community. Then as you get kind of more advanced use cases, you get into what we call this run. And this is where you're like really hitting your stride with service mesh. So you've probably introduced some approval processes to your CI CD pipeline. Uh, maybe when somebody wants to add a new authorization policy, someone else has to overview and approve it so that you know no one developer can accidentally break things within your mesh. You're probably adding rollback. And this is actually explicitly automated rollback. So say you do a canary release and 40% of the requests are returning HTTP 500s, which is way off your normal base. You know, you shouldn't need a person to say that that's bad. That's obviously like a failed rollout. So you can have the, the smarts built right into your system to roll that canary release back and go back to a happy state without having to like panic and set off the red fire alarm in your engineering DevOps team. Uh, delegation, this is one that's incredibly powerful for when your company gets really, really big. And, you know, you can imagine someone who has dozens or hundreds of microservices, lots of different teams working on, on things. You might not want the team that picks, for example, what domain your services are served on to be the same team that picks what all of their individual rights to go to your application get served. So your application team might want to handle one set of, of configuration and your ops team might want to handle another, another one. So that's, it's really important to be able to configure those in two different things and then set role-based access permissions so that only certain people can access certain things. 
Uh, finally, you might have some more advanced features like WASM, which is WebAssembly. It's an incredibly powerful Envoy feature that lets you write your own custom filters. Uh, you can use uh, several different uh, languages have implemented WebAssembly binaries. So you can use TinyGo, you can use Rust, you can use AssemblyScript, or you can use C++. And all of these are basically packaged down into a, an OCI image, which we then sideload um, into a WASM cache that then gets loaded into your Envoy proxy. So you can have all these custom filters at runtime without having to you know, recompile Envoy, um, fork it, have a whole build process, understand the Bezel build system, all that. It's more just like the standard Envoy paradigm of the XDS API. You just say, I want this filter, I've built it, go ship it, and maybe I'll change it later, but there's no downtime, there's no worrying about it. So it's, it's really, really powerful tool. Uh, finally, you've got this fly phase, and this is where you're getting to a really, really high scale mesh. So you're, you're talking about things like multi-cluster, multiple meshes, you've got global services. Um, so if you know a service in US East 1 fails, you probably want the traffic to start going to US East 2 rather than straight returning errors all the way to the, um, the end user. So you know we talked about like why Istio is great and how, how it kind of provides this single pane of glass and single point of configuration and single place to look at all of your metrics and observability. And that's true when you kind of have one cluster. But when you get two clusters, it gets a little bit trickier because now you have two places that you have to worry about writing all these resources and monitoring all these things. And you know, as that scales up to you know, ten clusters, twenty clusters, it start you start to see this problem. It's almost like the microservices problem again, but at the cluster scale, and uh, it, it becomes really difficult to manage. So uh, we've introduced this product called Blue Mesh, which is an open source uh, management plane that sits on top of all of your clusters. And um, so it runs from one cluster and manages your other clusters. And what this does is it lets you have that single plane, a uh, single pane of glass experience that Istio provides, but in that kind of multi-cluster environment. So you can see all of your configuration in one place. You can write all your configuration in one cluster and have that automatically propagated out. You can see any errors or configuration mistakes you've made all in one place. Uh, so for example, um, if you write one of those WebAssembly filters we were talking about earlier, your developers write it to the, the Glue Mesh management plane, and then that gets propagated out to your Envoy um, proxies in every single cluster that you have. Um, interestingly, because we're using Envoy both for the edge ingress gateway and for our sidecar um, service mesh, we can actually use a single piece of configuration to configure um, you know, what gets deployed to both and you don't have to like duplicate it. You can remember the same paradigms and use the exact same configuration objects in many scenarios, which is incredibly useful because you know, service mesh is complicated enough and we're just trying to make it easier and give you fewer things to learn. So uh, let's kind of walk through what that request path looks like and how that uh, failover situation kind of works. So here's our product page app from earlier. We've got product reviews and ratings running. And, and these, these blue um, squares are kind of representing two different clusters. So a request path comes in on the ingress cluster on the left. You've got your product page. Um, we know to write that to the product service. Like we said, the sidecar is going to intercept that request and send it to the local product service. The product service is going to make a request to the review service, which again goes through both of their sidecars because the sidecars know how to write those requests, who's allowed to talk to what, and handles things like mutual TLS and the end-to-end -end encryption side of things. Similarly, review service is going to talk to ratings, and then that response gets returned to the user. So that's the happy path. That's great. Notice we haven't even touched the second cluster here because we didn't need to. The request came in. There's no, there's no need in jumping that cluster gap, going to a different data center, adding latency. We're happy to serve that locally. But what happens if the request comes in and goes to the product service, and then we introduce a little bit of chaos monkeying here, and we're going to destroy these two services. So reviews and ratings, what happens when they go down? Well, if you don't do anything, the user is just going to get some kind of error message. Maybe your application is, is a little bit more fault, fault tolerant, and it doesn't you know, show the error to the user. Maybe you've got a grateful fallback. But no matter what, if, if these services are down, you've no way to calling them. That's that's not a great situation for your users to be in. So instead, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to probably want this to fail over to the second cluster because this cluster has the same services that failed, but these ones are still up and running. So you still have a version of these that you can use. So instead, we're going to send the request over to the review service in the second cluster, and then the request path continues on like you'd expect to the, to the service. So that's kind of what we want to happen. Let's uh, try do a live demo. How are we doing on time? 2.35. OK, we're going to try get this in on a demo real quick. Um, so here's the environment we have. I've, I've got canines running here just showing our two clusters. On the left, I've got a cluster called Management Cluster. Uh, and you can see here, this cluster's got our, our product page, and it's got version one of our review service. On the right, I've got our remote cluster. And this cluster has a Reviews v2 service and a Reviews v3 service. 
And both of those will talk to the ratings view one service to get those stars. Um, just a quick kind of, you know, to show you what exactly it is that we are looking at. This is the, the app that we've served on our cluster. Uh, I'm just seeing that product page directly here. And you can see these are the reviews that are being served by the reviews app in, in question. So just to go through what the different services are, uh, V1, like if you remember, doesn't have any ratings, so you don't see any stars here. V2 will introduce uh, a star rating and will return black stars. And then V3 will return uh, stars and then there'll be red stars. So, you know, and it's a little bit of a contrived example, but in reality, you'd probably be failing over to the same service, but this is just to kind of show you and prove to you that it's a, a different service that's actually returning the response. So what we're gonna do here is we go to our deployments and in our review service here, let me just make this full screen. I'm just gonna update this to use a bad version of reviews v1. So you can see reviews v1 is, is uh, coming up in this new version. And I just updated the image of the deployment to uh, an image I created earlier that's guaranteed to cause some trouble for us. This is our just chaos monkey to make sure we can get ourselves into a bad situation. So you can see this service is bad and will fail all requests. Um, so if I refresh the page here now, you can see, sorry, there's no product service. So this is the exact situation we want to avoid, right? We don't want there to be no, no review service whatsoever. Um, thankfully, Glue Mesh introduces this uh, very powerful concept called virtual destinations. And what a virtual destination is, is it's a concept that you can, you can group together using labels, multiple different services across different clusters, uh, bind them together in a virtual mesh, and then kind of have them be uh, aware of the locality that each service is running in. So it's always going to prefer the local service, but if there's no local services available, it'll fall back to services in other clusters, which is like that diagram we just went through on the slides. So what we're going to do here is go back to our terminal and we're going to introduce Oops, don't want to open Slack. Um, we are going to introduce this virtual destination. And you know, just nothing crazy groundbreaking going on here. Just wanted to call out. So it's it's going to be for the review service. It's going to uh, have localization enabled, and we've enabled outlier detection. So this basically says as long as soon as there's one error, and we've turned this down just for demo purposes, we're going, if there's one error within a five second period, we're going to eject that from the pool of routing for 120 seconds. Uh, in our reviews app. And it's just worth noting that both of our clusters are in a virtual mesh that I've configured it here earlier, just uh, in the interest of time. Now, uh, we do need to do one more thing real quick. Uh, so we have created a virtual destination, but all of the traffic is still just going to that local uh, service in the first cluster. So what we're going to do is introduce another glue mesh concept called a traffic policy. And what we're doing here is we're shifting traffic that was going to the review service and the book info namespace on the management cluster. And instead, it's going to go to that virtual destination we just created. So now that that's up, if we go back to our application and I refresh the page, there's those red stars, if you remember, that were from the reviews v2 service. And if I refresh the page a couple more times, we should start seeing some red stars. Should start seeing some red stars. It should be about 50-50. Not exactly sure what's going on there in the back end, but you can see we're no longer getting requests every time we fail over here. So I'm, I'm hitting refresh and we're not getting the any more requests to our, our version one that we know is a bad service. Uh, it's entirely possible that something actually went wrong with the, the version three service and that one also got ejected. That's probably why we're not seeing the red one here as well. But we're failing over to that um, that service in the second cluster. And just to kind of get that back into uh, a happy path here, we're going to go back to our deployments, go to our review service. And I'm just going to return this back to 115.0, which is our happy version. And as that comes back up, what's this, what this is going to do is... Um, now we have another service, Reviews v1. Uh, it hasn't had any outlier detection triggered on it because it hasn't returned any bad errors. So as soon as I refresh this, we should expect there to be, oh, it's still coming up. There we go. We should expect there to be no stars at all. So this is because we're back on version one, the one that doesn't use any ratings. And because it's, I think I hit refresh a couple times too much there, but because there's no, um, there's, there's no, we're able to serve 100% of the traffic locally from the cluster one, we don't have to forward any traffic to the second cluster because all of the services we need are local. So, you know, there's no need to jump that hop from US East one to US East two. Um, and, you know, it's probably worth calling out that's exactly how this is powered. So real quick, if I just grab the 
um, topology. So the server on the left is our management cluster. You can see we've set this to US East 1, and the server on the right is set to US East 2, which is exactly why it was failed over to afterwards. So that's kind of quick whirlwind demo of all that stuff working. Um, yeah, so you know, thank, thanks for coming to the talk. I know we went through a lot of things really quickly there. Um, you can tweet me directly at sabman 74 on, on Twitter. You can uh, talk to Solo at Solo.io Inc. Please check out our site and our blog. Uh, find us on Slack. We love hearing about especially novel new use cases, getting folks up and running with service mesh. This is what we do. We love doing it. Um, there's also some links here for Envoy Proxy and Istio, as well as WebAssembly Hub, which is kind of some more information on those WebAssembly filters I mentioned earlier. And finally, you know, we are hiring. So uh, we, you know, if this is something that interests you, please, please reach out. Uh, so it looks like we have a couple minutes left yep. for q and I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Shane. So we have a couple of minutes. Uh, I agree. So. Um, um, I will ask the first question. Um, someone, I think it was from Netflix, said a few years ago, if you think you need service mesh, you don't need service mesh. You know, it, it, it means that, meaning that, you know, it, it has to be a real need to, to have to implement such a infrastructure uh, for a high scalability. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you, if, if you're not sure, then you haven't really hit some of the problems. But I think a part of the some, sometimes when I hear folks saying that, a lot of folks maybe are still on a monolith and they're breaking it up and they really just have two monoliths or something like that. If you're really truly using microservices, you hit this problem almost immediately. And then, you know, you're left with your teams trying to write all of these like metrics and logging and outputs and everything you need for every application, it kind of falls on those application teams. So I think you get the benefits of the service mesh a lot quicker than folks realize. And, you know, like you said, I think a couple of years ago, service mesh was also a lot harder to adopt. There was a lot more you know, hurdles, there was, it was the user experience just wasn't where it is today. I think today it's just really easy to get up and running with a service mesh and see the benefits like on day one. Yeah, what are the, the, the main, let's say, uh, uh, common mistakes of people not implementing well service meshes? So having a just distributed monolith. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we see this a lot of the time where folks have, you know, a, an absolute monster of a monolith service and they've, you know, read about microservices and they think it's going to be like a silver bullet for all of the things that was wrong with their first service. And, you know, if, if your application is going to be crashing all the time, it's going to be crashing all the time, right? Like microservices isn't a silver bullet, but where it can really help is that kind of iteration. So like we showed earlier on in the slides, if you're rolling out new versions of services, you know, that's something that's really difficult to do in a monolith, right? Like if you have a absolute monster, like Java application that needs like three gigs of RAM to run and you just want a new version of like one of the 300 APIs it serves, you might need to like either serve a whole new monolith and then like double your hosting costs or like build both versions of the API into the same application. Like it's, there, there's not a graceful way to do it, but at the same time, you know, two very large, but slightly smaller than your largest application still isn't quite microservices. You know, it really is a whole paradigm shift that you kind of almost have to think from the ground up of how do we do microservices rather than just like a, you know, square peg that you can shove the round holes into. Uh, um, yeah, and, and there's also a pattern called uh, monolith first uh, or sacrificial monolith, you know, that, uh, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. I love, uh, I love that idea. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no please. Uh, so, uh, because the main idea is that, yeah, instead of investing too fast on a distributed architecture, that it will be a little bit more costly to manage in the terms of documenting and managing and setting up. Let's start with the monolith. Let's see if it works. Let's see if the application is taking off. And then when we will see constraints, let's try to, to uh, like decompose into microservices or into service mesh architecture, right? In a lean approach, like spend less resources to check validation. Uh, do you, have you experienced some uh, some patterns like yeah. that? No, that totally makes sense. I mean, you're, the, you're trying to avoid premature optimization, which is a very, very good idea. You know, it's generally something that you want to do. And also, I will say, like, you know, build it and then change to multi or uh, microservices, multi-tier architecture when you need it. Like, I've, I've heard that, and it's a great idea. I will say, anytime you build something a second time, you will build it better, and it'll be easier, and it'll go faster. So, you know, there's a lot of that going on as well. I would almost encourage anyone who's building anything, regardless of what pattern you're using, to build one to throw away, as the mythical man once said. And then, you know, the second one is just going to be better, faster. You're not going to make the same mistakes. Um, you know, there's definitely something to be said for for starting simple, but in my experience, you know, especially in, in like high growth situations or like startups where you're trying a lot of different things, you, you can actually, by, by having the freedom to have a microservice that, you know, you can spin up something for a POC or just a prototype 
And if it doesn't work, you can throw it away. No one's like overly attached to it, right? Like if you have a service that's 2000 lines of code that took someone a week to write, it's not the end of the world if that gets shut down and never seen again. Whereas I think even if you write a monolith to throw away, people can get very attached to it. And, you know, it, it'll, it'll start solving all these different things. And it, it kind of becomes that pet rather than cattle use case that we try to strive for in the, in the distributed architecture system. Yeah, that makes sense. So cattle, cattle microservices versus monolith pet, pets. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Shane.